look, it's the Prophecy Brothers. Starring Brother Man. And brother champion. They are brothers. They are unorthodox. David Daniels asks, Is the world's oldest Bible a fake? Good evening and welcome to the Prophecy Brothers. I'm Brother Man, and joining us tonight is the Honorary Prophecy Brother, Auntie Oligarchy. <laughs> welcome, Auntie. Uh, thanks. <laughs> well, we have a uh, special guest on. Of course, all our, our guests are special, but yeah. we have a real special guest on tonight, and that's David Daniels uh, from Chick Publications. And we're going to talk about this, and, and here's a question that I pose to our audience and everybody. Can you trust your Bible? Um, well, David says no, unless it's King James Version. And so we're going to talk about that. Now, David is an author of many books. We're going to talk tonight about his book, uh, the, is the world's oldest Bible a fake? Uh, he's also written a book called Hot Topics. Did Jesus use a Septuagint? Who changed the Bible? You don't know Jack, and I guess I'll stop there. We're the uh, Indiana David Daniels fan club here with all the <laughs> David Daniels books. So thank you for uh, joining us tonight, David. It is my pleasure. All right, and uh, I think that... Um, Somebody or something doesn't want us to get this information out tonight because we had some technical issues trying to get this going. We had some sound issues. So I, I'm, we're praying that, uh, and you said a prayer before we started, that uh, hopefully everything will keep working here. So, All right. Uh, well, let's get started. Um, David, your book, and um, there's, there's a lot in here, and, and obviously oh, yeah. to our audience, we're not going to be able to go over everything tonight, but so that's a good thing because David doesn't want to go through everything tonight. He wants you to buy a copy of the book and do the research yourself. But um, your book makes an argument that says the world's oldest Bible, something called Codex Sinaiticus. I messed that up. We had it down before. <laughs> Sinaiticus. 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 <laughs> All right. I'll forget it later. Is a f Anyway, your book says that it's a fake. Um, when they claim it's the oldest version, what, what I guess textual critics mean, or, or the experts out there, if, if they say it's the oldest, they also mean it's probably the most accurate. Can you briefly tell us uh, what this codus <laughs> Sinaiticus is and who are they that claim that this is the most accurate version of the Bible? Well, first, let me show you a 80% size replica of the Sinaiticus. So, oh, can you, oh, wow. you see it all <laughs> right here? Yeah. So yeah. if you imagine it a little bit taller and a little bit wider, this is a codex. A codex is simply a giant bound book. This book has giant Greek letters. Can you see that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Those are called unseal letters or majuscule, but whatever. It sounds like a song. Majuscule. But um, nonetheless, the, this is a big Greek text that looks like a really old style Greek text. When this was discovered in 1844, a man who is a textual scholar named Konstantin Tischendorf claimed that he had found something amazing, but he told nobody until 1859. In 1859, he got the majority of this, and then he put it together and published it and gave it the name because it was from the Sinai 
monastery or from the Sinai Peninsula, the St. Catherine's Monastery, he called it the Sinaiticus. The Sinaiticus. The Codex Sinaiticus Petropolitanus because he got it print, uh, printed up in St. Petersburg. Petropolitan. Oh, anyway. So, this book, he claimed, was actually older than the only other one that they had dated, which was the Codex Vaticanus, called that because it's in the Vatican. He believed that this book here would help you to figure out what was in the actual original copies of the scriptures. So that's why he said this was so important, and he passed it off as being genuine. Now, why would people say it's not genuine? There's a little trick you need to learn about what he did in 1844. In 1844, he told a whole story, which I will not go into. You can read it in the book. But, and it's well known. You can see it on every web website. Even on Wikipedia, you can see it. He claims that he was found in a trash can getting ready to bur be burned 43 folia. Uh, a folio is a full page like this with two sides to it, a front and a back. That's a folio. The 43 of these he was able to take with him back to um, Saxony in Germany, basically, and have it published. He called it the Codex Frederico Augustanus, named after Frederick Augustus, who gave him money to go on the trip, which is what you do. And he showed this uh, not in regular public where everybody could see it. It was kept with the king, and then he published his own copy where it was printed up with letters that looked like it but weren't photographs. Because it is 1846 when he got it out, yeah. okay? So he's not going to have a bunch of photographs yet. So then he has this published, but then he comes back in 1859. I'm skipping 1853. That's in the book. He goes back in 1859 and gets the rest of this stuff and takes that to Russia. That stuff he gets and does again, has those big letters copied, makes little, so that it looks a lot like the pages that are here pretty much, but it's the text that he printed. So when you look at it, you wouldn't see the actual pages. You see, you know, regular printing pages mm -hmm. of a book. The reason people say it is fake is can be seen on the cover of the book itself. And you can show yeah, this however show you want to do that. Absolutely. And you'll look on here on the cover and you will see that there's a bunch of stuff that's this kind of a brownish color, which looks mm -hmm. old. Then you see this other stuff, these two little strips here that look white. Why could that be? Well, it turns out that when he looked at it in 1844, the pages were white. They're still white to this day. The pages that he took out in 1844 and took to Germany, they're still white to this day. Hmm. It turns out also that in 1845, another guy, um, Porfiry Uspensky, who actually was over the monasteries and was an expert in texts, saw the rest of this as a book, checked it out, and it was all that color. And he says it was. Hmm. However, 1859, when Tischendorf took the rest out, suddenly it looked old. <laughs> now, the only way that you could tell that is if you were able to see the stuff in Germany and the stuff in Russia in one place. And that did not happen until 2009. First, some amazing technical people, photographers with big computers and cool computer gadgets and stuff got their cameras together and they took pictures of every single page in the different places. They took pictures of the pages that were, there's a few little bits that were in Russia still, because most of it went to England. It went to the British Library because, well, that's another story. I'll get to that in the next book. But... There's parts that are in Britain, there's parts that are in Germany, and other parts that were found in 1975 back in that monastery, St. Catherine's Monastery. They took all these pictures from the four different places, and for the first time, you could see them, codexsinaiticus.org, you can see it for yourself, and put them side by side. In 2014, Stephen Avery asked me if I wanted to join up with a group that he was doing, and I was like, okay, what's it about? The ancient Greek manuscripts. I went, okay. <laughs> I'm not. 
some big Greek expert, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be glad to do it. I mean, sure, whatever. And he says, take a look at these. And he showed me these pages. He showed me, I went online and I looked at the first two pages right over here. There's a, white, a dark one and a light one. And he says, do you think somebody used some Pepsodent on the, on the white pages there? Do you think somebody lightened the pages? And so I spent like four hours paging through. First, I checked the Greek text. Does the end of the dark page and the beginning of the light page, is that the same sentence? And I checked all the places where the white ends and the dark begins, the dark begin, ends and the white begins. And I went through all those places. They all fit. Everything was cool. So then I looked at it and went, does it look like it was whitened? So I sat there for four hours just looking at the text. And I looked at it side by side. And well, what's the color of the ink? Well, the shape of the ink? No, the shape is right. This is definitely the same handwriting. There's no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at it, zooming in, zooming out, because you could do that online. And I'm looking at the color, and I went, wait, if you've lightened this page here, then the ink would also be coming up, and you'd be able to see that difference, and a bunch of other things would happen on the page. And no. Yeah. Instead, it, I looked at this side of the page, and I said, you know what it looks like? It looks like when I was in seminary and I was drinking my coffee and <laughs> I spilled it in one of my books and then I started trying to clean it up. Only it looks like somebody almost like brushed it on a page. So then I turned the page over. I went, it looks like they kept on brushing and kept on going and turning another page, another page. And then it looks like it evened out. So then I went, well, let's look at the other side of those white pages to the dark side. And I looked there. It was more even, and it stayed more even. And then there's actually different phases, and I'll show them in different places. Here, here, I can tell where the New Testament starts, the phasing difference there between the colors on the, the, the shading on the pages overall. You couldn't tell. I made this giant poster. It's uh, You'll see it on my website and stuff, and you, you have a copy. Yeah. But I have a giant poster in the other room, and you can see these color shifts. And I realized... I think somebody darkened the pages. So I said, Stephen, is it possible that somebody like, I don't know, was counterfeiting by darkening pages? And he started looking it up and went, oh my goodness, there's this whole group of people, a move of people to counterfeit things in the 1800s. So now we're starting to think, there's a problem here. Somebody is counterfeiting this Bible. Instead of lightening these pages for fun and display, they darkened all the rest. That was the beginning of saying, is the world's oldest Bible a fake? You go on Wikipedia, you type world's oldest Bible, you go on Google, and you'll find Codex Sinaiticus. Because what it does is this manuscript is missing words, phrases, and verses. And it changes some others. So that scriptures now contradict each other. They don't say the same thing. And they lower the deity of Jesus. They lower the words about the Godhead, they take away words about angels, about devils, about heaven, about hell. They literally modify and take away parts of history, things that Jesus said, which we'll get into later on. And in the midst of all that causes such a confusion that you need a priest to sort it out for you. Doesn't that sound like a plan? Let's let's recap things here a little bit, David. So from from what you saw in what you read, okay, first of all, you looked at the pictures and you saw that they didn't match. There was a section that didn't match, and that was what Tischendorf took out, basically stole, and he took to Russia. Is that correct? And, and Germany. The first oh, ones Germany. in 1844 were to Germany. Okay. Those white pages were the ones that were taken out before I think he figured out that it was a fake himself. And that, that was a real life. He would have to darken those pages. I'm jumping ahead. You'll have to yeah. read it for yourself. You can make your own conclusions, but yeah, that's what I have in the book. But but so anyway, you looked at it online and you saw that um, the the colors didn't match. But there's actually, and you said in your book, it there's more than just um, you looking at it online and the colors didn't match because somebody could say, well, hey, maybe people didn't scan these in right or there's some kind of imperfection. But there was a contemporary of Tischendorf yes. that, yes. I mean, now you, you, pe you, Persky, you, Pensky, what was it? He said it was all white. You, it was all white. But Simonides said, was it Simonides that said that Tischendorf darkened it or there was a contemporary that's... Actually a monk that was there. A, monk. Okay. a guy named Kalanikos Monakos. Okay. Kalanikos 
uh, was a, a monk who is a friend of Simonides and also, but but wrote differently from Simonides. Some people said, "Oh, you're just Simonides is just writing and pretending to be a monk." No, actually, the locations, the things were sent from where Simonides was at the time, all that kind of stuff shows that there's no way he could have been in two places at once. Plus. They don't say the exact same thing. They actually have different testimonies slightly. But Kalanikos, everything I found when I researched that guy, Kalanikos Monakos, every point I found so far has matched history to a T. Ironically, almost everything I found so far of Simonides has matched history to a T too. But I go into that in here little by little you get to see it and look at the evidence for yourself. But what Kalanikos said is he saw Tischendorf saying he was cleaning the pages, but he was actually aging them. Yeah. So it was, um, so we've, and obviously our audience will read the book, but um, so it's not necessarily the oldest because why would you need then to make it look old? Um, but that doesn't... You have the oldest Bible. You've said it. You really said that. It's a great point. If you have... The discovery of the world, of the century, of, of all of Christendom, of finally having the oldest copy of God's words, why would you change it? Right. Yeah. Why would you darken its pages? Because it's not just Uspensky who saw it and was white. Other people who went to Saxony talked about the stuff as white, yeah. and the other people who saw the rest of it said it was dark. So you have contemporaries claiming, who've seen the different parts, what color it really was. In fact, Tischendorf himself, when he took out the rest of it, suddenly said it was suflava, which means this kind of a yellowed, aged looking. Hmm. Um, and then um, there are some that claim that thought this was, and I'm, we're jumping around here a little bit, but uh, Const Emperor Constantine had commissioned 50 Bibles that he wanted made that was portable, I think easy to read, and and uh, so people were saying that this this could be one of those 50 Bibles, but um, you, you kind of prove in the book, too, and if you want to explain it, great. If not, uh, people will go there. But um, you brought up in the book why it would not be one of these 50 Bibles you don't believe that was from the 300s. Yeah, well, one reason is... He wanted the best scholars and good calligraphers, it says, to put these things together. And if you look in here, as I have one chapter called Uniquely Bad, <laughs> and another one called Is That Your Best Job? Yeah. <laughs> because when I was a teacher, if a teacher, if a kid turned in something that looks like what you find, and you'll see it, in, you can watch the video series, but you can also see it right here in the book, and you see the kind of mess-ups and rewrites and erasures and scratch-outs and all that stuff, you'd, you'd hand and said, is this your best job? That's one of the things a teacher says, you know? Right. And they'd go, no, Mr. Daniels. <laughs> they say, here's a fresh paper, start over. But they didn't. So the fact that there's not only that, there's duplications. First Chronicles, there's parts of First Chronicles that are in there twice. There's all sorts of things that indicate this is more like a draft paper rather than a term paper. This is more like a draft Bible, not a final Bible. And I don't want to give too much away. There's a lot of story in the, in the book. Yeah, and it also uh, appears to be extremely rushed. Mm -hmm. So... <laughs> You do agree then. Yes. You do agree. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. looked like a rust job. Oh, right. totally. Yeah. 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 As a teacher myself, I can, <laughs> I can understand. Yeah. So, um, well, I'm going to shift gears a little bit with uh, a different kind of question. Um, so, uh, we both found it kind of interesting uh, that the occultist uh, Manly Hall, who is a 33rd degree Mason, endorsed the Codex Sinaiticus. Uh, when he said in 1944, and I quote from you, uh, for the last hundred years we have been trying to get out an edition of the Bible that is reasonably correct, but nobody wants it. What is wanted is the good old King James Version, every jot and tittle of it, end quote. Uh, obviously, a hundred years earlier, the Sinaiticus was discovered. Uh, why would an occultist care if the Bible translation is correct or not? 
First, let me show you Debbie's picture of Manly P. Hall. Doesn't he look like that? Oh, sweetie? Can, you raise, can you raise it up a little bit? There sure. Go, oh, I go. love that one. Yes, that was a scary looking guy. <laughs> yeah, it is what he looked like, too. He had these great goo goo eyes. Anyway, um, Manly Hall uh, was so knowledgeable about the occult. He basically befriended a rich lady, and he was already a spiritist at the time, and she just said, Oh, here, here's every bit of money you ever wanted. Go find stuff. And so he did, and he, in his teens and early 20s, was able to figure out the secrets of Freemasonry while not yet being a Mason. He figured that stuff out, so much so that a number of years later, they made him an honorary 33rd-degree uh, Mason. So he was a friend with 33rd-degree Mason Franklin Delano Roosevelt, President of the United States. They became fast friends, and uh, in fact, he sent his government officials to... to uh, do microfilm of all of his books so that they keep all these spiritist books. I want to know a guy with connections and with that kind of occultic influence as he and who talks about Lucifer and, and all that stuff that he says who's we? <laughs> who's the we that put together a Bible? We have been assembling this Bible. We? We? Well, it turns out that comes from something I had to assemble in little pieces because you can't, you couldn't find it online. Actually, it just came online. Somebody just put it up, so you can find it now. But I had to assemble this. It wasn't even there. And figure out what Manly P. Hall had actually said. I found this article from 1944, and he was talking about the establishment of a new world order. And in order to establish this new world order they needed to have everybody on board and use something called psychology and, and tolerance and bring it from kindergarten up and start teaching people how to do this, taking four or five generations to do it, it said. But the problem was these people who cling to the jot and tittle of the King James Bible. Now, this is the same guy who lifted up the Latin Vulgate, lifted up Westcott and Hort, even lifted up the Sinaiticus in other writings. Why would he be afraid, an occultist, of the King James Bible saying that the people who believe this jot and tittle will not join this new world order? Hmm. Yeah. Well. And that's part of the mystery we want to solve. <laughs> I'm going into some of that in the second book. So we're okay. going. And so we are, and he, t he said five generations. We're just, are we just starting the fifth generation now? We're coming into the fifth generation now. Yeah, and think about it. Psychology and tolerance. You don't ever hear that in the news, no, do you? No. We never hear about being tolerant. <laughs> no, no. We hear about intolerance, but... <laughs> I learned about that from a meme. Somebody put a meme online, and that's what started me going on this. Oh, yeah. Wow. I'm telling you, God can use some great things, some brothers in Christ. They find some quotes, and I'm going, is that for real? i got to find out, and got a book for it now. Sure so there we go. Is. Well, you know, since 1944, um, and, and we're talking about kind of where we're at in, in the generations and things, there's been a lot of translations and updates to the Bible versions. So it looks like they've made some progress. They're, they're, they're on their way to do that. Now, I um, we, we've had several guests on the show, and, and so I thought what I'd do is just take a survey of a few of them and see who had ever answered back and say, what Bible version do you like? What's your favorite Bible version? So um, maybe you can talk about how these relate uh, to the Codex Sinaiticus. Yeah, okay. You, you did know, it. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I, I butcher the language, all languages, even English. Okay, um, here are the, some of the guest replies. Uh, one of them, the, his favorite is the NASB 1977 version. Okay. A uh, couple guests said, okay, ESV, uh, because, and, and he said because it was from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay. Um, the New King James Version. And then another one said the NASB, which I guess is there's an updated version from the 90s or? Yes. Okay. 1995. So how are all these related to what we're talking about? To the Sinaiticus. Let's have some fun with Sinaiticus. Okay. Well, the New American Standard, I'm so glad you said the 77, because it's great. It's just great. When we come to Luke chapter 24, Luke chapter 24, New American Standard Bible, and you go to verse 51, it says, And it came about that while he was blessing them, he parted from them. 
That's fine. That's great. And then it says they returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they're continually in the temple praising God. Well, that's wonderful. Now, here's a problem, though. See, it was Gail Ripplinger, actually, who found it. So I cannot claim this one. This was in 1993. Gail Ripplinger came up with a book called New Age Bible Versions, and she pointed out there's a problem with that being removed. And by the way, the only reason it's removed is because it's removed from here. Oh. In fact, in the book, I even show you the place where it is and the arrow and where somebody scribbled it on the top of the page, but it's not a part of the Sinaiticus. Because of that... The New American Standard removed some words. So let me first show you what Acts says. It says, and this is reading from the same New American Standard. The first account I composed, O Theophilus, Theophilus not O, let me start again. The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach. The first account is, of course, the Gospel of Luke until the day when he was taken up. Wait, there's nothing about being taken up. Let's go back to that. Luke 24. Oh, there's a footnote. Some manuscripts add, and was carried up into heaven. Some manuscripts. So because of Sinaiticus does not have it, it says some manuscripts have it. Most manuscripts have it. Yeah. It says Sinaiticus does not have it. That's the truth. That was a, kind of a lying note. But it says here, the first account, until, uh, all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up. Which means, it had to have been in that text. So Sinaiticus can't possibly be right, because Luke himself tells you, my first book, Luke, actually has him being taken up into heaven. So... After Gail pointed out that their pants were down like that, <laughs> the 1995 put it back in. So now it says, while he was blessing them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. Hmm. So now the 1995 removes all sorts of other stuff, but if you really want to know what's in or out of the New American Standard, you can get this book, which you didn't show. Look oh. what's missing. I compare the King James Bible to 41 different translations, even including the new, 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 new NIV, so the 2011. So you can look it up and see for yourself all the verses that are missing, the words that are missing and stuff out of 257 different selected verses. And then I even have charts in the back and the percentages and all that fun stuff. You can see how the New American Standard Update is still removing stuff. Mm -hmm. But that's another story. Now, how? English Standard. Yes. Okay. Yes. English Standard, you said uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. That's fun. Let's see. Hold, hold on just a second. Here. I have all sorts of stuff in my office. <clears throat> Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, you got to ask yourself a question. Why would it make a difference to have the Dead Sea Scrolls? Now, we already know that the Hebrew manuscripts were passed down through the tribe of Levi. The scriptures tell you. Yeah. They were entrusted with the scriptures. They passed it down. And as they continued passing it down, family to family, group to group, through the priestly line, that eventually there became another group. There's no temple anymore, but they continued to pass it down. And then a group got together, which we call the Masoretes. Okay? The Masoretic scribes. They're just descended on the same line but they're now given a different name because they're no longer connected to the temple issues and stuff. And so for about five, six, seven hundred years, they continued to copy the Hebrew scriptures. And so we have this unbroken line. Very important. We know provenance. Yes. We have proof of where something came from. We have chain of custody. We know, just like in a courtroom, you have evidence and you say, oh, you have evidence tampering. No, we don't. We have a chain of custody. And we can show that we have the same evidence and it is passed through these tests and now we have the same thing here as was back here and we have the providence to show it was by these people. That's what we have with the Hebrew scriptures. That's amazing. 
Now, the Dead Sea Scrolls... Let me first show you... Why would they want the Dead Sea Scrolls? Because the only reason they'd emphasize it for, say, the English Standard Version mm -hmm. is if it had something that was different, right? Yeah. If it was the same, you'd go, oh, it just backs it up. And actually, over 90% of it does back it up. It's the same stuff, which is amazing because the Dead Sea Scrolls have zero provenance. We have no idea where they came from. There is no history of where they came from. There's no history of who did it. We don't know who passed it down. We don't know how long it's been there. And they're assembled from 17,000 little scraps of paper that have been computer reassembled over time since 1949, starting with microscopes and then working up to computers to assemble them together. So then, uh, although there are a few scrolls like Isaiah, there are two Isaiahs and there's uh, Exodus and Psalms. Those are the best ones. And those actually so largely match our preserved text of Hebrew, the Masoretic text, that there's no reason to even think about it. But if they go, yes, but it changed over here, therefore we're going to trust this. Trust who? Right. I mean, Joe right. Schmode in the street could have made his own copy and then set, and then stuck it in a cave. I mean, there's no proof of anything. No provenance, no chain of custody. So there you go. We need to have those to prove it. Now, what you would use it for in the English standard, specifically, maybe, would be this. The Apocrypha. Yeah. Yeah. See, what people don't tell you, and my own seminary professors did not tell me, was that the Codex Vaticanus, the Codex Sinaiticus, the Codex Alexandrinus, that they were using to change the New Testament, weren't just New Testaments. They were also Old Testaments. And the thing they called the Septuagint, which is uh, means, allegedly, it was translated by 70. You have a book there, did Jesus use the Septuagint? Yeah. yeah. The Septuagint is not just an Old Testament. It turns out that what they call a Septuagint that we've seen, any one that you can hold in your hand, is actually looking just like a Catholic Bible. It has an Old Testament, it has Apocrypha mixed in as if it were Scripture, and it has New Testament too. So obviously no copy of the so-called Septuagint could be that old because it has a New Testament attached to it. <laughs> right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> So that's a whole story more in the, did Jesus use the Septuagint goes into all the history of that but then so the other thing that you do with the Septuagint though is change Old Testament things but you want to know how many things there are in the Dead Sea Scrolls that apply to the Old Testament that have been said to be part of the Septuagint get ready because here they are ready can you see it a little bit a little bit yeah oh it. I'm done. That's it. All that talk is about those pieces of paper. Hmm. I got those from the University of Pennsylvania. I found them years ago, and I've checked ever since. I got books on the subject and everything. That's it. And most of those are dated close to the first century. So there's nothing that affects the Bible as a historical transmitted document. And if there's any changes, it has no provenance and no chain of custody and definitely no connection to the Levite priests, no way the apostles would have used it, no way Hebrew speakers in Palestine would have used it and the only time you actually hear of it being used is in Alexandria Egypt from the 100s AD onward Okay Well, and uh, that uh, you, you, you touched on Alexandria um, one of my favorite little bits in your book is the word apt. Mm -hmm. Could you uh, kind of touch on that for our, our audience and that might help. It helped me to keep it straight. Uh, and, and yeah, it was really fun. I want to be an apt learner and uh, the, the Bible talks about being apt and apt learner and I want to be an apt student of the word and so APT helps me. A stands for two things. Uh, there are two cities. There's Alexandria, Egypt, and that's where we hear about all these supposedly older and better texts. And then there's Antioch of, of uh, Syria, where the disciples were called Christians first. 
if you scratch any big scholar deep enough, you will find out that there are only two cities that everything goes back to, either Antioch or Alexandria. From Antioch comes the people that they called, the Alexandrians even called, hyper-literalist. Now, if you're a hyper-literalist, that means you're going to pay attention to every letter of every word, right? Yeah. That means you're pretty likely to want to have the same text and not change it. But over here at Alexandria were people who were spiritualizers or allegorizers. They did not believe the literal scriptures were true, and they allegorized them, and they thought they were smarter than the literal text. Who's more likely to change the scriptures? People who believe in every jot and tittle of it, or people who believe that they have the right to manipulate the story for their own ends? Uh, so that's the two cities. And then, so we... The one I say in Antioch is apostolic, because the apostles are connected with Antioch. The other is Alexandria, which I call apostate, because the people here were apostate Jews. They left Judaism, and or, or, the Hebrew religion before Judaism, and they were apostate Christians as well, because they literally blended Christianity with uh, Gnosticism, Paganism, Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, and things like that. So that's A. P, the apostles preserved God's word. Very simple. If it's the words of God, the people in the apostolic group want to preserve it. So that's the P here. The P here is polluted because they modified it by adding things, taking things away to accord with their modified beliefs about Jesus, about Godhead, about heaven and hell and devils, about history and events and all sorts of stuff. So that, the P here is not, is, is polluted. Then we have T. There are two things, not one. Like when we get to the New King James, it's largely the same Greek and Hebrew text, not all, but largely the same as the King James Bible. Very, very close, except for a couple things. There are two things that we talk about. Usually we talk about the text. That's the first T. The text, of course, is definitely different when you have words added or taken away. But the other is translation. An amazing thing happened. Instead of the historical understanding of Greek and Hebrew words, there became a change in the 1600s starting in the Catholic universities in France and then going into Germany and then into England and America where they changed the meanings of those Greek and Hebrew words, even how to teach Greek and Hebrew, so that you would come up with different meanings of the text. So... Since I mentioned New King James, let me give you one more thing. Because you mentioned New King James, I want to show this to you. What is one of the most famous statements of Jesus around the world? When he was on the cross, and his enemies were around him, like Psalm 22, they're calling on him, calling against him, and they're, they're, they're reviling him. Jesus looked down at him and said, Father, forgive them. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. That is known all over the world. Here's the New King James. They intentionally, from 1982 onward, wrote all the textual notes of the disagreeing verses from Bibles and put them in the footnotes. And they said in the directions that you get to make your own decisions about whether you think it belongs or not. And so on this verse, it says, NU, the Nestle's UBS text, brackets the first sentence as a later addition. Why would they take out the words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do? Because they're missing from Codex Sinaiticus. Now, let me ask you a question. If the most famous verse, one of the most famous verses and statements in the Bible, you cannot trust. And you cannot trust that God preserved only what he wanted. How do you know he is going to preserve your soul? If the God who promised to preserve his words cannot preserve a book, how is he going to preserve your soul? How can you know? And if that doesn't belong, how do you know that John 3.16 really belongs? How do you know you're not going to dig in the dirt in a new cave somewhere and find an older investor? And then that one will say, there is no John 3.16. 
Or maybe it'll change the words. Are you going to put your faith in that? Or in the historically passed down by persecuted believers Bible? And that's where I go. You have a choice to make. Do you believe what God preserved? Or you believe what God hid? The modern people say, you crazy people are saying that this beautiful manuscript sniff <laughs> by the way none of my professors ever brought this into the classroom this is by the way you have to shake thank jack mcelroy i have learned more things from this because he sent this from massachusetts to here so that i could study it wow. so wow. props props for him um this beautiful book you're saying that somebody counterfeited this in the 1800s Yes. What are you saying? That God hid his real words? Missing words, phrases, and verses that you suddenly have to take out of your Bible after 1,800 years? Because the 1,800 years goes both ways. One, you can say, this was a faked Bible, and I have all sorts of evidence that you can evaluate for yourselves. Or two, that God allowed a fake Bible to to be around for 1,800 years, and then suddenly, in the 1800s, turned everybody to Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, which the Vatican was so happy about, they gave special accolades and awards <laughs> to Tischendorf and all the textual scholars who would work with it, because when they worked with it, they had a lifetime of work, because everything's so disagreeable in it. There's so many erasures, so many changes. In fact, in my next book, and I haven't even put these videos out yet, but in my next book, I'm actually going to show you guys that there were two groups of monks that were fighting against each other over what readings to write in the margins while correcting this draft copy of the Bible. Oh. That's another story I'll get to in a few weeks. <laughs> well, there's. Uh, can you touch on the, the uh, Gospel of Mark in, in relation to all of this, causing yeah, some, this some is, doubt and what was left out? I would love to. Um, in fact, it was at my old Bible college. You can It's actually on... In fact, if you look at some of my videos, you might even actually find my Bible college's video. Uh, I just lost your sound, just in case you're wondering. Okay, can you hear us now? Oh, no, I hear you now. I hear it now. Okay. You can cut that. In my old Bible college, um, my own professor... I was his top student, and he had a former top student before that, which I mentioned, you can see his name in here, and on YouTube, they actually filmed when they talked about the Codex Sinaiticus, and they spent a lot of time doing this for me. They did all the work, um, and what they said in that session was the same thing that 30 years ago, 30 plus years ago now, at, um, for a Resurrection Sunday um, service, my professor came to a local church. My wife and I came and listened to him. He said the same basic words. And so, literally, he put on film what he said in the church and basically said that there are certain things that don't belong in the Gospel of Mark. And it's because they're missing from Sinaiticus. Now, this is interesting because there's just two words missing up here. This is the Greek. It says, kara markon, according to Mark. And here it says the beginning of the gospel of Jesus, Jesus Christ, uh, Jesu Christu, Jesus Christ. And then it goes on to verse 2. Well, your Bible, if you look at it typically, most Bibles say this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. This does not originally have the Son of God. A corrector wrote it really tiny in the margin right here. Do you see it? Oh, yeah. yeah little thing. Okay, now that tiny little mark in there, <laughs> that mark in mark, uh, changes the meaning of the entire chapter of Mark 1. Here's how it works. If you don't have the words Son of God, then you don't have the pre-idea that Jesus Christ is God's Son. Okay? So then it starts out and says, okay, John the Baptist is here, and he's baptizing people to forgive their sins. So they're coming to get their sins forgiven. They're getting baptized to get their sins forgiven. It says so. Then you move a few verses down. It says Jesus also came. And Jesus also got baptized. What do you imply from that? People were going to be baptized to get their sins forgiven. Jesus also came. Jesus also was baptized. 
Implication? He he's getting his... Yeah. That he's getting his sins forgiven. Yeah. Exactly. Then it says that God spoke from heaven, Thou art my beloved son. <laughs> That's called adoptionism. An early cultic belief, a Gnostic belief, was that Jesus was a man who had to become the Son of God. Now, that it may not to the people who are listening right now go, it doesn't say that to me. I know who he is. I have the other Gospels. and No, but you're reading the Gospel of Mark, and you're reading what it says. Could it actually make a scholar believe something like that? As a matter of fact, yes. Where is my book? Here it is. The guy who photographed Sinaiticus first in ni the New Testament in 1910 is a guy named Kearsop Lake. He wrote this book 15 years after he photographed Sinaiticus. It's called The Religion of Today and Tomorrow. It's a very interesting book, hard to find. I, I'm so happy to have it. Listen to this about just chapter 1 of Mark. He said, for it may be argued, oh, I have to tell you a word, apotheosis. Apo is from Theos is God. Apotheosis means God becoming from heaven and becoming a man. Okay? So apotheosis, God become man. We call it the incarnation, to use the Latin term. For it may be argued that Mark knows nothing, even of an apotheosis, of God becoming man, and only shows that Jesus was believed to have become a son of God, possibly at his baptism, and that the disciples, and perhaps Jesus himself, believed he was the Son of Man, which only means man, who had come from heaven at the last day to judge the living of the, and the dead. This is adoptionism. But it's not necessarily apotheosis, and it goes on. So, this guy himself says, who photographed this manuscript and knows that it doesn't have the Son of God, and it's about the only thing that does, doesn't have it, says that Jesus was adopted at best as a Son of God, and that's as close as it gets. Later on, a few years after that, in 1941, Kearsop Lake wrote these words to see how it affected his faith. It's in here, and look what's missing. In spite of the claims of Westcott and Hort and of von Soden, we do not know the original form of the Gospels, and it is quite likely that we never shall. That's the opposite of what Tischendorf said in 1844 and 1853 and 1859, 1862, eight, all through 1867. That's the opposite. He said, now we shall know exactly what God did, and we shall show this wonderful thing about what God, God's words were. But that's not what they did. They did the exact opposite. See, we already knew what God's words were. They were passed down by the persecuted believers. And in English, we have them in the King James Bible. So, it really comes down to two things, doesn't it? It comes down, uh, like you said in your book, uh, faith versus doubt, or doubt versus faith, and it's to create doubt. Absolutely. The devil had uh, a plan B that he did during early Christendom, and that was try to kill people and destroy their Bibles. Well, it didn't work, because there's always more Christians, and there's always preservation of Bibles, because... God kept the promise. God didn't say, man shall have to keep the Bible for everything to be good. He said that, you know, said, thou shalt keep them, O Lord. You know, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. It was God's responsibility. Jesus himself said, mentioned three times, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words, S, shall not pass away. It was God's responsibility to put all this together. And I forgot your question. Oh, faith versus doubt. But yeah, that's but they there's want to a create fourth it. step. So plan B was to kill the people and destroy their Bibles. Plan A is the Garden of Eden. Yay. Half God said? It causes four steps. And this is exactly what happened in Genesis chapter three and exactly what happened with the modern Bible movement. The first one is confusion. Yea, hath God said. Yeah, has he said it? Did God tell us what we're supposed to do? Is this God's word? Is it not God's word? Confusion. The second one, doubt. I'm no longer sure. I, I, I doubt. I doubt he did. I'm, I'm just not really clear. 
I, I don't know. I, I'm just going to hold back on that one for now. Welcome to Bible College. That's now. <laughs> Disbelief. I don't believe that God said this or that God really meant to preserve it. And the fourth is rebellion. I'm going to go my own way and do my own thing. And the devil doesn't care where on that stairway that you go as long as you're on it. And what it is is the devil doesn't care what Bible he gets you to. All he cares about is which Bible he gets you from. If you can hold one Bible, as I can right now, and I was trained in all this. I was top in my Greek class. I went into advanced Greek at Fuller Seminary, took my Hebrew, went and did Wycliffe Bible Translator stuff, Summer Institute of Linguistics, continued reading Papyrus. I have all sorts of books on the stuff. been reading it for decades. And I found out I was wrong. My professors were wrong. I was wrong. God really did preserve his words. I can hold this book, and I do regularly, and say, I believe every word of this book. It really is God's book in my language. Nobody can do that with ease. Yeah. It's faith versus doubt, and it really is the Christian's choice. Um, the reason I felt compelled to contact you about the show is we get uh, mail here at the house occasionally for Wycliffe uh, Bible translators because uh, the person that uh, we bought the house from was associated with them. So, And so I was just like, is this a sign telling me to contact David about the Bible translations? <laughs> yeah, well, Wycliffe Bible translators, um, in that book that you have over there, why they changed the Bible, one world Bible for one world religion, it's almost like the answer to, the, to, to this book. It tells you the end game. And so I'm doing all the other books to tell how we got to the end game. So we're kind of at the end game with uh, why they changed the Bible, and we're at the the beginning game with how it started in the 1800s with faking the Sinaiticus and maybe Vaticanus, but that's another book. There's uh, so we have this possibility of how they moved toward one world Bible, and they needed a guy who is a man at the crossroads to create a Bible movement that would lead you toward the fake Bible, away from the real Bible, and into enough confusion that you would need a priest, or enough agreements with Rome yeah. that Rome would say, we have to approve of this Bible before you can distribute this Bible. So they had agreements, 1966. They had these agreements, but that's all in that book. Now, um, in your opinion, okay, they're, they're switching to a one world Bible, and I think in order to do that, eventually they're going to have to make the leap. They're creating the doubt now. They're going to have to make the leap that Jesus was just a prophet, as maybe the Muslims say. Do you see the Catholic Church getting behind that? Is there going to be a point where maybe they'll say, hey, we were. We were wrong all along. Jesus wasn't so God. He was this prophet, and we need to merge with all these other religions. Is that... Do you think that's what well, they're going to do? Very interesting question. I've not ever been asked that one in public before. <laughs> uh, there is a possibility. I mean, if you use your imagination, one thing you have to say is that, as I already believe, and you can see it on the website, um, on uh, youtube.com slash c slash chick tracks, on our YouTube site, I do believe that the Whore of Babylon from Revelation 17 and 18 really is the Roman Catholic Church. I go through nine points to show why it is, and I give you pictures and everything to take you through it one step at a time. But I believe that they that, that the Antichrist is going to be either the white, or more likely the black pope, the Jesuit general, or because now we have a Jesuit pope, we kind of have both at the same time. But... Um, that what they declare is that the Pope is Christ on earth. Now, is it necessary to have Christ in heaven if you have Christ on earth? Can they lower that Christ to raise up the man? Because guess what? When your professors lower the scriptures, they raise themselves. Yeah. When my professors lower my belief in this Bible, they raise up my belief in this one. But wait, what if my professor now came out with this one? The same professor comes out with another Bible, but I'm going to believe him here. You see what I've done? I've shifted from trusting God to trusting man. Now, yes, men 
got together on this. But unlike other Bibles, when the King James was put together, 1604 through 1610, then published in 1611, it was done in such a way that 54 plus people total were going over the text no less than 14 times. And they weren't allowed to go off by themselves and have their individual thoughts. They had to literally convince everyone else of their beliefs. And only according to the rules of the game, if they disagreed after all that work and everybody else agreed, but one guy's still like, no, but I like my view, then he got an or in the margin. Hmm. So I always tell people, if you see the word or in the margin, you can ignore. <laughs> so, but this is a Bible based on agreement, such agreement of people with two different points of view. The Puritans who are really... Uh, narrow in their way on seeing scripture and they strip their churches bare and stuff like that and then the ornate um, Church of England they had all these people getting together and agreeing on the words and they prayed and they trusted God and um, you know how you know a tree? That's fruit. fruit The fruit of the people who believe this book is a book in itself. It's actually multiple books. I have a lot of the books of the people who believe this book. The wor the largest worldwide missions movements are started by people believing this book. Yeah. The largest the denominations where people would split away from something that had pulled away from God and come back to him, this book. This book has brought together um, people say, well the pilgrims came over and they had the Geneva Bible. Well isn't it funny? We don't have a single Geneva Bible that went over the Mayflower. My ancestors, the Hopkins uh, through the Hopkins line came over on the Mayflower. The only Bible that we know came over on the Mayflower was the King James Bible, believe it or not. Hmm. That's the one we know. We actually have a co there's actually a copy of it in Massachusetts. Um, of the original. It is in Massachusetts. But my point is, the next generation of all the pilgrims, despite the fact they started with the Geneva Bible and their political feelings, ended up with the King James Bible. Their children trusted this Bible. And our country was even founded by people who believed this Bible. So I believe that this Bible has a fruit of faith. I have never seen a revival of faith with any, not even the New King James, not the Revised Standard, not the New English Bible, not the Revised English Bible, not the New and Improved Contemporary English Bible, the, you just name it, the Message, the Good Speed, the West, the Moffat, you name it, Living, Dead, whatever Bible you have, not a single one of them has brought about faith like that. Yeah. So the fruit is in this book. If nothing else... Be a fruit pick, fruit chooser, you know. Pick your fruit wisely. I I want the fruit of faith. Yeah, there is, there is always a um, when people are using the other translations, they'll, they'll read a translation and they'll say, "Well, let's see what the other one has to say." And it's that that doubt, and then it's picking. Well, which one do I like the best? And they become the Bible scholar. Right. <laughs> Stage four rebellion. I'll do it my own way. Well, when you start picking uh, verses or words to suit what you think is right, then you are, whether you're aware of it or not, participating in becoming godlike. Yes! I want the Pack Bible, the pick and choose version. <laughs> I want the multiple choice version, the MCV. <laughs> pick whatever I want to believe. This time, I want this to be about males. This time, I want it to be about males and females. This time, I don't really care what it is. Animals are fine. You can make your Bible the way you want to when you are the judge of it, instead of the history and transmission of faithful, persecuted believers. Now, let me ask you this, and this may not come out right, but you were not always a King James only, <laughs> right? Yeah, when you were in Bible college. So, Not even close. so let's say meteor hit California at that time when you were, or whatever, and you you died. Were were you saved then, even though you weren't King James? We are not saved by books. We are saved by faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ who died for our sins. We are only saved by putting our faith in the Son of God and not in ourselves. First, we turn to Him, which is all we do. We repent, which means we turn to Him from our sin. We're not stopping. We're, we're in the midst of our sin. We're 
and filled with yuckiness. But we turn just like the people who had been bitten by serpents. Jesus said, talking about looking upon him, mm -hmm. right? If yeah. I be lifted up, I'll draw him into myself. And then also, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have or have eternal life. So that's what God provided, that you turn and look upon him. Behold, when they beheld the serpent up on the pole, which was representative, although it's a serpent, because they were bit by serpents, but the, the person who became a curse for us, like a serpent on a pole, they beheld him, and they were instantly healed. So they were still yucky while they were turning, they were still dying, they were still writhing in pain, but when they turned and looked upon him, and upon the, they looked on the serpent, they placed their faith that something was going to happen, right? Yeah. Well, when you turn, repent, and look upon Christ and place faith in him, it always says repent and belief, repentance and faith. It never says faith and repentance, because you have to turn first to know who you're looking at. Right. Right? And then you place your faith in the Son of Man, God's Son, the Son of God. God. <laughs> yeah. Died for your sin. And trust that His shed blood paid for your sin, paid the penalty, then you're saved. It is not a matter of what book you read. However, if you want to grow in faith, you need the words of faith. See, Romans 10.17 says, Faith cometh by... Hearing, hearing, God. and hearing by the word of man. <laughs> God. Oh, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So if I have the word of man, then faith is not going to be the product. I need to have the word of God. So if I want to grow in faith, and Romans 1 says we go from faith to faith, even as is written, the just shall live by faith. The way to do that is to have the words of faith without the mixture of man's opinions. Amen. <laughs> okay. So, um, any other questions, Auntie? I do not know. I think that pretty much sums it up <laughs> for now. Or we could keep talking for another hour. Yeah. <laughs> well, definitely everybody's got to... Um, you got to get the book um, because... We've only scratched the surface of what the research David has done. And uh, you probably need to read it. I actually start going through it a second time um, just because there's a lot in there. And, um, but I think you really do, uh, you, you do make the case because these new versions are based on a fake. And, um, and so I think everybody needs to realize that and whether they still want to trust um, trust the version that they have so uh, David your books can be ordered at chick.com correct all of them there that's right you don't even have to put the www just go chick.com enter and it'll take it right there I haven't read this one yet but I understand that this is not printed out anymore you have a very rare copy. They're they're only an ebook now. Yeah, that's, that's when I interviewed Jack about why he wrote different tracks, and I got the interview in there. And since Jack's in heaven, that's the only place you're going to find out what he said about those tracks. And then he and I wrote actually I basically wrote Home Alone. I'll take the the blame, um, but the, the Home Alone tract is also in there, and we talked about why we wrote that tract. I got this from Goodwill actually. I found wow. it there. Yeah. Out of Texas. I found it online and they put it up on, it was on Amazon. I got it through there. But yeah. So, uh, but the rest I did get, uh, oh, I think I either got from your, from Chick or some of your books are available on Amazon too. But, yes. um, and, uh, well, this just became available on Amazon today. It okay. just, so the, and not just the ebook, but now the physical book you can get. They had a glitch, but now it's available today. So, it's the perfect day. You got to see it right now. And uh, last time that we talked, uh, we were testing out your new computer in Skype um, almost two months ago now. And I asked David a question about this book, and he yeah. goes, Did you read the appendix? And I'm like, <laughs> No. 
<laughs> guess what? I still haven't got to it yet because I got to your other book. So I promise <laughs> I'll get to that. So well, it's ten thousand words. I got a letter from another person who said uh, that the appendix alone was worth the price of the book because it has all this backup in context where you can look at it for yourself. And I have to tell you. I had no horse in this race when I started. I didn't care where the Sinaiticus came from. It didn't matter to me. My faith was already here yeah. for other reasons. Whether it was ancient or modern, I didn't really care. But when I found out that it was, I found out it was part of a larger scheme. And what started out to be two maybe little two videos turned out to be that book. So and it's literally by a person who didn't care. Uh, and now... I found out, and now it's exciting because I'm I'm the guy who watched Columbo three times in a row. You know that. that. Well, I'm very interested to uh, to see your next project if you're going to uh, tackle Vaticanus in the same uh, zest. Uh. <laughs> well, actually, this is just part one. See, the first book is part one. Part one here is is what Tischendorf said happened real. Did it really happen? Could it have happened? Or is there an alternative explanation? That's this book. The second book that I'm already working on, and it's in our video series on, on YouTube right now, is what really happened during those days? Yeah. And then after that is what happened after that. And after that is what happened to the people who were the clingers to the King James? How did... How were they trying to get those people, and still are today, trying to get those remaining people away from the jot and tittle of the King James? And that'll go on. But in the midst of that, there's either two possibilities. One, in this next book that I'm working on now, that the Vaticanus, once I finish with Sinaiticus, the Vaticanus will start popping up at me. Or two, once I finish with this, I'll do a whole new series and start on Vaticanus and see what we find out. <laughs> <laughs> so it's good that there's more to come. More yes. to come. So definitely, everybody, uh, thanks for watching, and get David's book, and check out his vlogs at on on the YouTube channel, Chick YouTube channel, and go to Chick.com to order the book. So thank you, David, for joining us and and uh, piquing everybody's interest in in uh, in what's real and what's fake. So next time we'll see you, everybody, on the Prophecy Brothers. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to our YouTube channel.